can't get these people to sit in a room together, let alone in a show together. I could not tell you what Esther did. I could not tell you what John did. I knew nothing about him. I know nothing about him now. If you are a 70s kid, you probably recall the phrase dynamite. Dynamite! Well, the actor behind that iconic phrase has been spilling some beans about the shady underbelly of Hollywood. I would come up with stuff and somebody would say, no, you can't do that. And I said, man, I know that. Despite the show ultimately achieving immense success and catapulting Jimmy Walker into stardom, backstage affairs were far from smooth sailing. In fact, it was so bad that even the actors did not speak to Walker outside of the set. I don't remember ever speaking a word to Esther the whole time she was there. I think the same basic job. We were never friends. So what exactly went on behind the scenes? Well, let's start from the very beginning. Jimmy was born on June 25th, 1947, in New York's tough South Bronx neighborhood. His ambitions were not originally to entertain. Basketball was his prime interest, but the idea that a gawky, string bean framed teenager could become a hoop star did not seem realistic. Instead, he abruptly quit school and worked an odd assortment of jobs until wisely returning to night classes at Theodore Roosevelt High School and redeeming himself with a diploma. The federally funded search for education, evaluation, and knowledge next came through for Jimmy as he was able to learn a trade, radio engineering, announcing. Within a year, he was hired as an engineer for a small radio station, but gained a minor reputation on the sly as a funny guy and good writer. This side interest is what motivated Jimmy to try comedy performance. He made his stand-up debut as an opening act on New Year's Eve in 1967 for The Last Poets, a militant poetry group, and was such a hit that he stayed with the group for a year and a half building and polishing his jive-styled act. At one point, Jimmy was seen at a Manhattan club by comedian David Brenner, who referred him and others, such as Freddie Prinz, to Bud Friedman and his improv stage in New York. Jimmy eventually became a regular. His debut shot on TV Variety came with Jack Parr's show, and his successful 1972 appearance propelled him to main attraction billing. He was quickly checked out by the Norman Lear team and practically handed stardom on a silver platter with Good Times, a spin-off of Esther Roll's domestic character on the popular mod series. Skinny, energetic, and youthful looking with plenty of harmless sass and attitude, Jimmy and the show were instant crossover hits despite the fact that he was a 27-year-old playing the teenage son of Roll. But soon, issues began to arise. The actors couldn't help but notice that while the cast was almost all black, the writers of the show were nearly all white. As Amos put it in an interview with Vlad TV, the writer's idea of what a black family would be and what a black father would be was totally different from mine, and mine was steeped in reality. This feeling that the show was descending into stereotypes soon became centered on Walker's JJ, who had rapidly become the show's most popular character. JJ was a likable, goofy slacker, and and as his popularity increased, the writers drove him into being more and more broadly comedic. Slowly, the whole show came to be centered on him and his catchphrase, Dino Might, which producer John Rich insisted he say in every episode. John Amos and Esther Roll, who both had activist inclinations of their own, were displeased by the turn the show was taking. As Roll put it in a 1975 interview with Ebony, he's 18 and he doesn't work. He can't read and write. He doesn't think. The show didn't start out to be that. I resent the imagery that says to black kids that you can make it by standing on the corner saying dinomite. This caused a huge rift among the actors to the point that they never spoke to each other outside of filming. I don't remember ever speaking a word to Esther the whole time she was there. I think the same basic we were never friends. Additionally, fierce disagreements among actors and producers over the difference between the show's initial socially conscious premise and the new direction it was taking led to Amos being fired from the show after the third season. The writers handled it by having James Evans die in an automobile accident while visiting the South, leaving Florida a widow. In a new interview with Sway in the Morning, the actor shared exactly why he was fired from his hit television show, saying his desire to make good times more authentic rubbed producers the wrong way. The truth of it was when the show first started, we had no African-American writers on the show, and some of the attitudes they had written, as per my character and frankly for some of the other characters as well, caused me to say, uh, uh, we can't do this, we can't do that. And they'd say, what do you mean we can't do this? 
Amos continued. They'd go on about their credits and the rest of that, and I'd look at each and every one of them and say, well, how long have you been black? That just doesn't happen in the community. We don't think that way. We don't act that way. We don't let our children do that. The industry vet admitted he didn't express his grievances in the most professional manner, which resulted in his character being k et off and him getting the I left because I was told that my services were no longer needed because I had become a disruptive element. In other words, I didn't have the diplomacy that I think I've cultivated over the last 10 or 15 years, Amos confessed. Being born in Newark, raised in East Orange, I had a way of voicing my differences against the script that weren't acceptable to the creative staff. I mean, the writers got tired of having their lives f***ed over jokes, the actor went on. So Norman Lear had called me one day and said, John, I'll share two things with you. The good news is the show has been picked up for another 20 four more episodes, which was a given because we were in the top 10. The bad news is that you won't be with us. So there was a long, long pause and Norman said, are you still there? I said, yeah, I'm still here, but I wasn't. I was no longer with the show. Anyway, a year after Amos's departure in March 1977, Roll 2 left the show that had been created for her. The writers handled this departure by having her meet and marry a man named Carl Dixon and move to Arizona. The show's ratings were already sliding by that point, and even the addition of Janet Jackson to the cast for the fifth season, as a traumatized young girl taken in by Wilona, couldn't save them. In a desperate bid to shore up the show's popularity, the producers convinced Roll to come back for a final season in 1978 to 79, but the damage had already been done. Good Times, which had started so promisingly as a show devoted to an actual, if comedic, depiction of black life, had become just another goofy sitcom in an era dominated by them. The sixth season was to be the last. In any case, other a-list black actors such as Denzel Washington have also spoken up on this issue of having white directors for a black show. For context, in a 1990 essay, August Wilson made it clear he'd only allow a black director to helm an on-screen adaptation of his Tony-winning Fences. In 2016, Denzel Washington fulfilled that wish, directing and starring in the film about an African-American family in 1950s Pittsburgh. During a town hall with the cast, Sirius XM Urban View's Karen Hunter asked why this was so important to the late play Right. So why did he need a uh, black director? Could a white director not have? It's not color. Work? It's culture. He then added, Steven Spielberg did Schindler's List. Martin Scorsese did Goodfellas, right? Steven Spielberg could direct Goodfellas. Martin Scorsese probably could have done a good job with Schindler's List. But there are cultural differences. I know, you know, we all know what it is when a hot comb hits your head on a Sunday morning. What it smells like, that's a cultural difference, not just color difference. The A-lister also discussed how the parts available for black men in Hollywood have changed since he entered the business. It's much better now. There were no roles like this, he said. I've been in the game whatever it is is 35 40 years obviously it wasn't like that when i started if you got a role at all which is why i thought i'd just be doing theater the rest of my life i really didn't aspire to be a quote unquote movie star because i didn't see anybody that looked like me anyway so i didn't tell jokes and i wasn't going to be that third what's his name from the back i got too much ego for that so i said well i'll do theater but it is much better if it ain't on the page it ain't on the stage so you gotta write it he added to applause august wilson is writing how we feel that's why i'm producing all 10 of his plays. Because of all those people who laid the groundwork for me to be in the position I'm in, I'm going to make sure that there's hundreds of roles for the next generation and utilize the power that I have at this moment in order to do that, and nobody's going to get in my way. Anyway, following the end of Good Times, Jimmy Walker has been captivating audiences for four decades now. He continued his career as an actor and a comedian, appearing in many hit TV shows like The Tonight Show. Even with his success on TV, his main interest lies in stand-up comedy, and he makes it a point to spend 35 to 45 five weeks a year performing live. Jimmy's creative juices are still flowing despite moving away from mainstream television. As for his personal life, Jimmy Walker never married or fathered any children, but he appears to have enjoyed his life to the fullest. He was speaking during a 2012 episode of The Wendy Williams Show when Jimmy said that he had numerous girlfriends. However, there were many rumors that Jimmy Walker had been married to Friday the 13th actress Jerry Fields since the 1980s, which was caused by their appearance together in The Tattletales from 1970. But they were never an actual couple. In 2017, rumors started circulating that he was in a long-term relationship with conservative speaker and columnist Ann Coulter, 14 years younger than Jimmy. Still, Coulter denied the rumors by tweeting, Best of friends love him no romance like Jimmy and Coulter. Coulter never married but was involved in several celebrity relationships, including comedian Bill Mayer. But the news of Jimmy dating Coulter came from a source very close to him, Norman Lear, who produced Good Times. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.